I think I was about eight, just over eight stone ringing wet. And I wanted to be a para. The greatest British Taekwondo team ever. And proud to say I was a member of it twice. He was classed as the best ever Thai boxer of his era. And the bar owner, crazy woman, pulled a gun on him. Dave, how are you, mate? Great, mate. Yeah, thanks for having me on the podcast. Ah, that's my absolute pleasure. Um, yeah, um, I'm enthralled to be here. Good, that's what we like. I'm, I'm trying to think who we've got to thank for putting us in touch. I, I'm sorry, folks at home. I, I honestly get so many messages a day, I can't remember. Yeah. Ronnie, Rocket Ronnie. Ah, yes, of course. I made it wrong in Thailand. Yes, thank Fantastic you. Fantastic bloke. Very nice bloke, yeah. And so, Dave, let's just start off. You, you, you've been in, in the wars a little bit recently. Yes, yeah. So it all started, Chris, I'll let yeah. you and the followers know. It all started in when COVID hit Thailand. I was living in Thailand. I was there 21 years. had a great life. And then suddenly COVID hit and it wiped out my business. I had no clients left because I was doing photography. I was doing photo shoots. I was blogging. You know, I had a website. So people would at bars and restaurants would advertise on that. And it all dried up. As soon as COVID hit, it was a nightmare. And I had to get out fast. So my family said, get out now. And I just got on. My, my friend booked me a flight and I was out of there. Sadly, but that's the way it goes. That was April 2020. And then I got back to England and I was just starting to get used to, well, that's my Thailand adventure over. Now I'm back in England. I was just getting used to England again after we got out of the lockdown. And then I had the, uh, I had the AstraZeneca vaccine. And I got a horrendous fever from that. Horrendous. It lasted three weeks, Chris. My, my left foot swelled up, came up like a balloon. My sister looked at it. She just said, she went ballistic. She just went, 999 ambulance. I was rushed into hospital, Peterborough City Hospital. They attempted the four operations to try and save my foot. And in the end, I lost my leg. Gosh, that's... <laughs> It's, it's hard to give that the magnitude it deserves, it, you know, over the internet, isn't it? I mean, you, yeah. w- what you've just been through is, it would be most four, people's worst nightmares. Chris had four operations, 10 weeks in hospital. Mm. I'm out now. I'm guessing the medical community are never going to um, consider the fact that it might have been might have been due to this uh, procedure. Yeah, basically, they just said, um, very hard to prove, hard for it to be connected, but come on, there's nothing wrong with me. I had doctors had balanced my diabetes. I was on oral medication. They got it right. There was nothing wrong with me. There's nothing wrong. I, had, I do admit that I had three toes on my left foot had been amputated in Thailand. I do admit that, but they had fully healed. This was five, over five years ago, Chris, mm. and they were fully healed. There wasn't anything wrong with me as far as I know. And they, and, and if, if it wasn't the vaccine, then how do you explain this horrendous fever that lasted three weeks? Man, I thought I was nearly dying. <laughs> That's what, you know, I was just unlucky. That's all. Yeah, it's, it, it's, um, ah. But up until this, Chris, I'd like, just like to say for all your followers, 
I've had a fantastic life up until this. I had a really, which we no doubt will explore, mate, won't we? <laughs> yeah, well, let's 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 talk about that. And um, I just wish you well with all all the other thanks, Chris. All the other stuff. You're obviously um, putting a very robust face on it, which is all we can do in such situations. Um, yeah, but that's me, Chris, and you'll find out why when you you know, learn a bit more about me. Yes. How did you get into the martial arts? Right, yeah. As a, I'm, I'm a small town boy. Um, my mum and dad didn't, I didn't have much money. I was bullied as a kid. So I wasn't anything special at all. I was quite timid. Even you wouldn't think so now, the way I talk, iron legs off a donkey. <laughs> the teacher said, he, he, he seems a bit withdrawn. But uh, then basically what happened, I said to mum, I said, mum, I'm fed up with the Boy Scouts. I said, I can't stand, we can't stand the leader and he wants to throw my mate out. I want to leave. So she said, OK, well, what do you want to do? I said, well, let's go to the YMCA because it's an open day. I had no idea what was there, but I thought my mate said, join the YMCA. Why don't you join the YMCA day? So we went to the YMCA and there was a Taekwondo class. And I said, Mum, that I was 13. I said, Mum, that's what I want to do. That is definitely what I want to do. And she said, Well, if you only if you're sure, because I've got to pay for it. I said, Oh yeah, I'll tell you. And uh, Chris, I must say, it was the only thing I'd done in my life so far, that far, that I was a total natural at because I had the physique. I was extremely supple. I was like, I was like rubber, mate. So I was just, a, I was lucky. I was a born natural. Yeah, took to it like a duck to water, mate. A bit like me, mate, really, because I, I go taekwondo twice a week. Oh, and right. I, As you can obviously see, I've got the looks, I've got the body. And um, yeah. well, slim, yeah. I, I watch my son. Well, oh, I, I watched my son train. I was so supple. I could do what they call, what I call the banana splits because I'd put my heels on two chairs and make a massive curve. I was so supple. It was, it was a joke. So I had, na I had natural ability. I was very, very driven because I used to mess about doing Kung Fu in the back garden with my cousin, even since the age of about 10 or 11, playing around. And uh, basically, Bruce Lee, it all starts stemmed from Bruce Lee. Because, of course, we, we were too young in those days. You couldn't go to see the films. But I had a wonderful uncle, an Uncle Bill, who used to tell me all about Bruce Lee. He used to buy me every book, every magazine, every poster. And I wanted to be Bruce Lee, basically. I wanted to be like Bruce Lee. So I started Taekwondo and did very well at it, Chris. Yeah, become... A career. I uh, my instructors said Dave's so e exceptional. Let's put him in the tournament. Put me in a national British full contact all styles championship. And I was young, really, as very young. But they sneaked me in the men's division, <laughs> and they won it. Quest for the champions that was. Yeah, Bruce Lee was some win a string of English and British titles, and then. Um, I did have a brief spell, tried to join the British Army. So uh, I had this crazy idea at 18. I think I was about eight, just over eight stone ringing wet. And I wanted to be a para. <laughs> I don't know why, Chris, but I just got it in my mind, my tiny mind. That I wanted to be a para. But, I, you know, I was disillusioned a bit in the end. And I had a go. I failed a back squatty three times, fell P company three times. I wanted a fourth go, and they stopped me. They thought I was a bit of a psycho. They said, you failed three times, Mears. I wanted another go, but they stopped me. So I came out, but look, at it. well, I came out just before Kit Falkland's War kicked off in 1992. And then I went to Italy with a group of people called the United Kingdom Taekwondo Association, under the great leadership of Dave Oliver, if anyone knows the name Dave Oliver, my God, most successful English-British coach ever, the greatest British Taekwondo team ever. And 
proud to say I was a member of it twice, you know. So we went to the European Championships, won that. And then in uh, 1984, we beat the greatest ever, the undisputed USA super team. They were WACO and PKA, which is Professional Kickboxing Association, undisputed world champions. And they got a big shock because we beat them. So the Taekwondo Association, Great Britain, England team, beat them. I was lucky to make that team because the lightweight, uh, the, the number one was Ron, a man called Ron Sergiu, a good friend of mine, but he was injured. He had a bad knee injury. So they called upon me or was the number two. And luckily we all won. So there's a bit of an intro that I got into the martial arts, Chris. Yeah, what's it like then when you're going to go in for a scrap? It, it, I think, are, are you terrified? Are you, are you calm? What, what, how do you build yourself up for that? Well, I don't know, but ever since, I think it was just because when I went into Taekwondo, also, actually, reminded me, when I was very young, I got a very, uh, I went to see him the other month, actually, is that. My boxing coach, Lesnar, bless his heart, he's 96 now. And he, he, uh, he started teaching me boxing from a young age, you see, 16. So I was learning to box as well as Taekwondo. And no, I didn't really fear it because I, I think it was just my mindset. It was just me. And I think, like I say, Chris, to be honest, I was lucky that I was so naturally talented. I was very, I was very gifted, naturally. And so that helped a lot, yeah. So no, not really. In fact, I tell you, at that tournament, I think of this, I, I could see this, uh, you know, my opponent looking at me and sort of sniggering with his coach. Yeah, look at him, he's only a brown belt, because he was a black belt. And he looks young and skinny. And I whacked him as hard as I could with a, a straight punch in the solar plexus and knocked him out in the first round. Knocked him out. It was less than a minute of the fight. Yeah. So it was definitely something there. Chris, yeah. yeah. I'll tell you what, Dave, I'm just going to say now. Like, like you, Chris, you went on to be Royal Marine, which I have great respect for. You, you, you found your calling in life, and I think that's happened to me. I found my calling in life. Some people, sadly, maybe don't. They don't reach their full potential because they did not find the thing that is, suits them the most. Yeah, writing was the thing that suited me the most. I didn't find that until I was 38, <laughs> I think. Oh, no, no, but there you go, you see. Yeah, I'll, I'll run to say something there, Chris. I was completely useless at school at sports. Oh my god, the teacher! I think he, he he nearly wanted to give me an F. I think I got an E or something. <laughs> you know, I got really bad grades in sport because it didn't interest me. I wasn't interested in football. I didn't like football at all. Mm. And yeah, <laughs> I used to get kicked off the field and told to go and do a run because. I try to kick someone in the head. <laughs> we want to become food kicks. I try to, try to kick them in the head or something. Yeah, I was a bit of a nightmare at school, but I went on to become world champion. How, how does that happen then? How, what, how do you become world champion? Yeah, I think, uh, well, in the martial arts, as I say, we were lucky because um, in, the, in the UK, TA and TAGB, these associations under the great leadership of Dave Oliver and Bob Hale, they're always looking for talent. My instructor, bless him, Malcolm, he took me, he took me to Leicester. Leicester one shame. That's where we met the world champion, Ron Sergiu. We started training there. And he sort of put me forward. He said, this is my best lad. This is Dave. And he, he sort of said, wow, yeah, he's really, he looks really good. He's international material. So they, They'd already then he talked to the head coach 
and that's how how i got i got spotted i think and i started then going i had a very good instructor he's very proactive he'd drive me everywhere take me to squad training england squad training i got into it yeah and that's how you progress and then of course your big chance comes up one day when you get selected for the England team. It's like going through selection with the forces, you know. You've got to be in it to win it, man. You know, you've got to you, you go for it. Yeah, what... Yeah. Uh, Actually, you... on, the, on the note of the Royal Marines, I want to say that I followed, for 1984, incidentally, I followed the Royal Marines fitness course. There was a book that they bought. And I did that because we had to be super fit because the USA super team were, well, they were undisputedly the best kickboxing team in the world. So we knew, I knew it wasn't any messing around with these guys. So I trained professionally six days a week, hour, several hours a day I'd be training. I'd do the Royal Remains Fitness in the gym. I'd start the day with my running coach, a 10-mile run, road run in the morning. We could do that in 50 to 55 minutes, which is not bad considering not runners, really. It was just part of my training. So do the run, get back, have a little break, then go into the weight room, do the weight training, have a break, go home for dinner, relax a bit, go back in the afternoon. I've got all the gym work to do then. That's when I'd start on the Royal Marines course. And then after a break and uh, my tea and everything, I've got to do my training at night. Uh, super fit, absolutely super fit. Mm. As you well know, Chris, if you follow the Royal Marines, you're going to be very fit. <laughs> yeah, I can't say I was ever that, to be honest. I didn't get fit until I was... I must, didn't get... You must have been, mate, because you made it and they're, they're the elite. Well, I'm a, it, it, I'm a big it, fan of the British forces, all of them, and I think they're marvellous. I think the, the British soldier, whether he's a Royal Marine, a parachute regiment soldier, or SAS or SB, they're the best in the world, and they taught the world how to soldier. They say yeah. about the Americans, they've got all all the gear and no fucking idea. <laughs> they've got all the all the expensive kit, but a basic soldier. I was trained by Peter McAleese. He trained me in unarmed combat. So I've done CQB with him. And I don't think there's finer, there's finer soldiers in the world, but there's a lot of people. I know it's a big argument, you know, US Navy SEALs, they're the best, SEAL Team 6, they're the best in the world. But who taught the world how to be a special forces soldier? None other than the British SAS. And I'm very proud to say that I'm a friend of not only Peter McAleese, I've worked with him, but Rusty Furman, the legend, absolute legend, the hero of the Iranian embassy siege in 1980, who led the assault. Wonderful man. Yes, so him, and all, him and... I just want to say, Chris, before... I ramble on too much, but just say big shout out for everyone, anybody who served, ladies or gentlemen who served for the uh, for the British Armed Services. Well done. Thank you for your service. Yeah, well, the, let's just say I don't think the veteran service is over uh, just yet, mate. But that's another uh, conversation okay, from now. I want to talk about more interesting stuff yeah let's talk about bangkok and and now we're talking mate yeah what a fascinating place well it all, i'd say it all stemmed chris from a good friend of mine because i i started to branch out in martial arts so from taekwondo to boxing then thai boxing that's how the thailand connection came and my friend lived there and he said, Dave, you'd love Thailand. He said, why don't you come over? You know, you can work on your Thai boxing with the real world champions and you'll love it over here. You'll absolutely love it in Thailand. So that's exactly what I did. And I got a local company to sponsor me to go to train on a, on a 
one of the top Thai boxing camps, which is called Sit Yod Tong Payakuru, Sit Yod Tong Camp. And it's near Pattaya City. And, um, you know, which many people know the seaside town, call it, I call it Soho on Sea. <laughs> There's more birds there than anywhere. <laughs> The rest of Thailand, I think. But yeah, so this camp was just in a in a little village just outside there. That was amazing because my training partner was none other than Samat, Samat Payakaru, who is anyone who knows Thai boxing will know that name. He was classed as the best ever Thai boxer of his era. And he won a world boxing title on top of that. Absolutely amazing guy. So that, that, Chris, is the sort of level that I train with, yeah. And these and guys you have do a bit of from... experience, don't you, Chris, from Bangkok? Yeah. I was just saying, look, look at the shape of my nose. You can, you can see... You've got to be very careful because I, I want to say this for warning. It doesn't matter. I knew some American lads. They were huge, big, big lads, really big. Huge, they were tall, big body builders. But you get 10 ties around you, all tooled up, mate. Doesn't matter how big you are, they'll soon chop you down to size. The ties don't fight fair. And if they think you're a bit of a threat, well, they just have five of them or 10 of them waiting for you. I know because I used to be a bar manager over there. Which bar did you manage? Yeah, that's a great. Great, great times. There's a place in, in Bangkok called Nana Plaza. And I was very lucky to run one of the best for many years. Six years I ran Hollywood. It was on the top floor of Nana Plaza. And then after that, I left. There was a fantastic, many people say the best ever show bar that's ever in Thailand. It's, we've won awards and everything. Angel Witch. Rock dancers, angel witch, rock dancers, absolutely fantastic club. We, well, three years in a row, they won best go go bar in Bangkok, they won the award. And Patia was voted by the US Navy best club in Patia, great honors. So they've got the awards behind it, but they, they I can't take all the credit i was just the manager the owners would were, were were ingeniouses but ironically it was a german man and a thai lady boy and she was full sex change but she was they extremely creative with the stage shows they and all of their shows were unique and guess what happened one day one of my friends said dave you've got to get down and get down here now i said what's up is there a, What's going on? He said, you'll never believe he's just walked into one of our bars. Steve Tyler from Aerosmith. I said, you're joking. Yeah. He said, no, get down here now. So I had a plan that I put into operation. And I said, hello, Steve. And may I call you Steve? And he said, you may, man. You can call me what you want. You may, man. And I said, I'd like to introduce you to Angel Witch, where we're going to perform a show for you to your song, Dream On. And he said, Yo, man, that sounds great. Let's do it. <laughs> so there I am sitting with Steve Tyler in Angel Witch, and I get my top girl to do the show, which, of course, was already in the show repertoire. So it was, it, it was a choreographed show. He loved it. He said, that was fantastic, man. He, he absolutely loved it. What a, a super guy he is. He loves his fans, you know. He just look, you know, he, he's really, really an amazing guy. I tell you, he just went to the toilet and the bodyguard was right next to him. And he walked out and he goes, hey, Dave, what's through there? And I said, that's the girl's change. <laughs> he like pulled the curtains over and just dived in. That was Steve Tyler. Amazing guy. Really amazing. That's just one of many stories, Chris. Yeah, it's an amazing place. But the, the top people go there, of course. I had a very good friend called Dave Walker. Now, he served with the British Army. I don't know, sorry, what regiment, but he, he served in Northern Ireland. Although he was Canadian, he joined the British Army and he served in Northern Ireland. He was a fantastic guy, Dave. He went on to be a journalist. And uh, any, any 
everybody in town, because, of course, being a journalist, he knew who was in town. He used to bring all the famous guys to it. And one day, I couldn't believe who walked out. I thought there was some kind of raid. I said, what's going on here? Who are these people? There's an entourage of about Thai, eight, eight, I think, eight Thai men, serious-looking guys. And I thought, well, that's a security team. That's That can't be police. Or is it army? Well, is this some kind of raid? And in they walk with Steven Seagal, the Hollywood movie star. <laughs> And you're not going to believe it, Chris, that guess what bar I worked in? Guess what it was called? Hollywood. <laughs> I'm not joking. It was on the top floor. It's called Hollywood. Yeah, that, that was the truth. And just to meet him, I mean, you know what I'm like, motor mouth me as I just talk, talk, talk. I was silent. I couldn't speak. Steven Seagal. Well, that was that was impressive. But the best one I ever, ever met was definitely Steve Tyler because I made it all happen and we did the show for him to his song. Yeah. But met a few. Yeah. And the same guy again, Dave, he said, you're never going to guess who's just walked into your bar. I guess, Go on. Who is it this time? He said, it's Oliver Stone. I said, what? The Hollywood movie director? He said, yeah. They're doing a movie in town. And... The guy with him was very, a very, very nice guy, very humble. And we're still friends to this day. And that was the former world light middleweight boxing champion, Gary Stretch. And he has absolutely lovely bloke. And he was one of the only people to ever beat Chris Eubanks. And he's, he's a wonderful lad, Chris. He's a wonderful lad. But Gary's my boy, yeah. One day he surprised me and my boss. He walks in with this hold all, drops it on the floor. And he's, I thought, what's going on here? And he said to me and my boss, he said, I've got something to show you, lads. And he pulled out, he says, try that for size, Dave. And he gave me the WBC belt, <laughs> the world title belt. Yeah, amazing guy, Gary. Lovely, lovely lad. So just a few stories there, Chris. Mm. So... We want to hear about some fights, so mate. Come on, what what scraps did you see, and 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 who got hurt? Right, I think actually you'd be a little bit surprised, but mostly people are, are going over to Thailand. They're having such a great time. You don't really see so much trouble, and especially now they've got professional security teams on the front of Nana Plaza. Really good. They're, re they're really good. They check bags when they come in, the security checks. They, they check girl, uh, the, the girls the girls that are coming in. They check their IDs that they're of age, got to be at least 18 to work in a bar. It's all very good now, I must say. They, they, they might even stop you and say, and look in your bag, make sure they're not bringing any weapons in or drugs or anything. It's very, very good now. So, you know, people, I think it's not like the, but when I first started, Chris, my God, it was like the Wild West. I know a bar, a bar owner. He went to one bar. This is how bad it used to be years ago. And he said, I'm going, I'm going to this bar. I'm going to, I'm going to try to get some girls. So, you know, we just didn't say anything then. We thought, well, this is not going to end very well. And he's, he's sitting around, he's buying them all drinks. He starts handing out his name card, which is something you don't do. I mean, sort of have a gentleman's agreement. You don't go handing your name card out to the girls. That's di deliber deliberately poaching them. You're trying to steal the girls. And he gets this jab in his ribs. Yeah. And the bar owner, crazy woman, pulled a gun on him. Yeah, she shoved a barrel in his ribs. She said, I wouldn't do that if I were you. That's what it was like. It was like the Wild West, man. Yeah. There's a, I'll tell you a story. Not so much fights. There's a crazy policeman. And he uh, called him Toon. His name is Toon. So we call him Toon the Loon, I call him. Toon the Loon. Oh, my God. We're in a downstairs bar. It used to be rough and ready in those days. And there was rats running around. And he'd go, boom! And he was a terrible shot. 
he missed the rat completely. <laughs> it was ducking and diving from ricochets. Oh, good crazy. That's two in the loo. Let's his gun off in the bar trying to shoot the rats. That complete nutters. But you're talking about Pat Pong. Well, one of my friends was down there. And what they do, you've got to be careful because they say it's a bit like Soho. You've got to think Soho. They go, oh, we have a special show for you, sir. Yeah, I mean, it's going to cost you a lot of money. And it's just a rip-off, like they, they used to do in Soho. Um, my friend said, no way, I ain't paying it. And he got the bike guy by the scruff of the neck. But the guy stuck a gun in his face, Chris. I mean, they don't, they don't mess about in them days. But I must say now, it's, it's a lot better. It's not, you know, there's not really so many guns. There's not really so many, no, nowhere near as many guns now. They just get arrested, yeah. Yeah, but not, you wouldn't, you wouldn't actually, not so, so many punch-ups. I to think people are just, you know, you're generally having too good a time, you know. But the Thai lads do not mess around. And they will, they will win the war. Of, they will, they will win it. it you know, if, if they think, oh, there's a there's a few of these lads and they're quite big. Well, they'll double or treble the numbers to beat you. They'll get a gang of ten onto you, or yeah, they they will win. They will win the the battle. I will tell you. Well, um, do they still do the do they still do the sex shows? It was all that ban now. Well, um, there was a massive clampdown, and not so much now no, because there's a massive clamp clampdown by the Thai government. It was when, it all started really when Prime Minister Taksin came in and he wanted to clean everything up and everything. But I, I think in a way it's better because it's more regulated now. You know, for example, the girls have to be of age. They've got to be checked. It's not degrading shows like they used to do in Pat Pong. I mean, yeah, it, it's cleaned up a lot. Yeah. Taxin divided the country, though, didn't he? Taxin Shinawa. Uh, yeah, he was very loved by the working class ties, though. He won them over. But I don't get, I don't do politics, really, Chris. I don't like to get into it. But the big people in pe in Bangkok didn't like him. Yeah, so that's why he was ousted. Yeah. Yeah, he owned, he owned a telecommunications company. I have to say, but a lot of the emphasis has gone away from the bars now. But you can still have a fantastic time in Thailand. They're lovely people. They really are. And it, you know, if you go to the islands, they're absolutely stunning down south. Phuket and Koh Samui, Koh Phi Phi, Koh Banyang. Absolutely beautiful. Yeah. And so what's, what's in the future for, for you, Dave, because obviously life's changed, changed a wee bit now. Hopefully not yeah, too, um, hopefully not too changed much. Changed a lot, mate. But I'm the sort of person I don't. You know, I used to tell them in the hospital, I don't do self pity. I just get on with life. I'm still, I'm still got a life to lead. But I'm very lucky that, um, you know, the Taekwondo Association, we're in the GT UK, so the Global Taekwondo UK under uh, Grandmaster Roy Oldham. And I've known him. He's like my big brother I never had. A fantastic guy. And he's a Grandmaster and he, he wants me back. And he said, uh, yeah, I want you back, Dave. And I've start, I made a start. I do their social media. And one skill I did learn in Thailand, because I was trained by some professionals, it was how to be a photographer. But i got to say, Chris, there are a lot more interesting and lovely subjects to photograph in Thailand <laughs> than I'm going to have here, mate. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah amazing, just... amazing experience in Thailand. You make you make the most of life, though. And I, I have a, as I say, I'm lucky. They think the world of me over here in the GT UK. So I can't wait to get. And you don't know. I've seen some amazing guys, ex forces amputees do some amazing stuff and i wasn't world champion for nothing i don't give up you know i'll, I'll get i'll go back into it but i just don't know to what degree chris or 
how long it will take. It's a process. But, but I always believe what got me through this really is to say to people is what I call PMA. Just have a positive mental attitude. And it will, it, it's a remarkable what it will do. It will get you, you through things. Absolutely. And uh, that, that's clear to see. So, David, I wish you all the best. I love talking about Thailand, here in Thailand, Thai stories. Um, yeah, it's been, you know, it's been a good podcast and maybe if we do another one, then we could talk more about my stories about Peter McAleese. Save it for another time. And maybe yes. Chris. Yes, Peter. I, been a... all day. I want to try to write a book about it, actually. Bangkok, um, some of my, obviously my memoirs, but warnings to people, what to do and what not to do. Yeah, but it, it, I had a fantastic time there. There's a guy, um, unfortunately, many of us who were forced to leave Thailand, and a guy called Man, and he got a fantastic website called stickmanbangkok.com and one of the best compliments i've ever had he called me mr nana well, that's amazing to be named after a place my god let alone named after a bar i was named after the whole complex nana entertainment mm -hmm. plaza amazing his last tribute to me was when i had to leave forced to leave thailand because i did know a lot of people i blogged about it um, I had my own website. I was sort of like an ambassador for, for the place. So he, he, it was by, by Mr. Nana. Nice tribute. But Brilliant. my life now is here, Chris, like you, mate. I'm in City Street and I'm back in England. But um, I want to finish by saying that the National Health Service is marvellous in this country. Yes, we have to protect it from, from Mr. Branson, don't we, the, the thieving bastard? Um, do you know why they do you know why they privatize companies? No. It's so they can sneak off all the technology, you know, so they can get dabs. Well, dabs on, what I'm trying to say is from a patient's perspective, I've been through it. I've been through the mill, mate. I had four operations. I was in 10 weeks. And I tell you, they're absolutely marvellous, the doctors and nurses. Yeah, we got to protect the NHS at all costs. And uh, that ain't happening. That's not happening at the moment, you know. So, so I just wanted to say, Chris, a big shout out for the National Health Service and the, and the British forces, still the best in the world. Yes. Call us like the EU or the, oh, the bloody British and all that. But I tell you what, they won't want the bloody fighters, mate. <laughs> yeah. True, true, isn't it, mate? You know. Yeah, you've just named two professions, though, that need to start uh, speaking up a bit because yeah. they're, um, you know, there's only so much you can keep quiet about before you're, you're not really respected and you're not doing the country any favours. And fortunately, that's that's starting to happen. And massive big up to this nurse. I'm, I, I don't know her name, but she's been on the AJ Roberts show. And she's telling the truth about what's going on in in the NHS. And we need to see more of it because, um, you yeah. know, if you want to be a, right. you be a so legend. Say, Chris, it's been a great uh, privilege for me to be on, on your podcast. Thanks very much, mate. Yeah, no problem. No problem. And, and I highly a... respect you for your service. Seven years with the Royal Marines, mate. I'd respect me more for my service now, mate, if I was you. Because, um, <laughs> yeah, the, the, you know, there, there is a struggle on. War to now, Chris, is going back to Thailand, and I won't have any of the headaches of being a bar boss. I'll just be on holiday. I'll be a tourist. I can enjoy myself. So in time... And not only that, I'll take some beautiful photos and do a bit more traveling, see 
which one country which I haven't visited yet say is absolutely stunning is Vietnam. A lot of people talking about Vietnam now. People yeah. are fantastic, they're lovely, and it's a beautiful, picturesque place, yeah. So I would have to say, Chris, I think that's about it. Time's up, isn't it? Yeah. Long podcast. And thank you very much for hosting me. Great honour for me. No problem. Just look after yourself. Dave, yeah, maybe yeah. In, in another chat we'll talk about my times with people like Peter McAleese and my friendship with Rusty Furman, another SAS legend. Yeah. A few we stories. Yes. We thanks very much, Chris. Yes. My pleasure. Just look after yourself, Dave, won't you? And I should just say I'm to all our... right, mate. I'll be all right. Yeah. I'm a survivor. Yeah. You? yeah, you will be all right. I can see that. Friends Thanks, at home. Chris. Keep me up, mate. Yeah. Friends at home, hope you've enjoyed this as much as I have. Um, if you can like and subscribe, that would be wonderful. And see you all soon. Thank you.